Um, oh, am I supposed to do that now? I said, yes. Welcome, Jeff. Wait, Jeff has been teaching for 40 me? years. <laughs> <laughs> he loves teachers. Jeff, can, he specializes in Victorian literature. He can teach anything. He loves to teach anything. Once he, uh, he said, Sam, pick a text, pick a text that teachers like to teach. And I said, To Kill a Mockingbird. And he said, Oh my God. I mean, yeah. How many times had you read To Kill a Mockingbird by the time okay. you were 12? So many times. I can't even 40? count them all. Yeah, yeah. yeah over, a lot. And over and over again. Yeah, I just. A lot. Yeah. And yeah. almost anything you can ask him, how many times he's read it, and it'll be some enormous number. But anyway, Jeff is also uh, teaches in addition to Princeton, he teaches at the Breville School of English, which was the inspiration for the Academy for Teachers. So yeah. Yeah. his heart and soul is very much in the, uh, the intellectual, spiritual, and creative lives of teachers. And uh, he, there's no one who believes in the importance of a profession more than Jeff. Um, so Jeff, thank you very much for doing this today and I'm gonna turn it over to you now. Okay, thank you so much, Sam. So um, I'm just gonna to talk to you about this poem for a little bit and then uh, we will see where you are and where we wanna go from here, okay? I, um, so the poem is Investiture at Cachonis and I was struck as I was thinking about this poem again uh, about uh, the, uh, the uh, connection and uh, difference, the, the, the similarities and, dissimil and uh, dissimilarities, so to speak, between the current uh, uh, emergency and the one that this poem is very much about. And I want to actually sort of talk about that a little bit. So have, has everyone had a chance to read the poem? Yeah, uh, um, I can, just a nod of heads is fine. If you haven't, I just want to know that. Actually, okay, cool. If you've had, if you've had a chance to read it, if you could just nod, let me know that the answer is yes, that's fine, okay. Okay, cool. All right, so investiture at Cachonis, I wanna, um, I, I wanna just begin, and I wanna actually begin by reading the poem, if you're okay with that. Um, Caro, that dream after the diagnosis, actually, I'm not gonna just read it, I'm gonna actually talk about it along the way, if that's okay. I actually just wanna, rather than making big comments about the poem abstractly, I wanna go right local. I wanna start right away locally, okay? Caro, dear, that dream, parentheses, after the diagnosis, found me losing patience outside the door of our Italian tailor. I wanted evening clothes for the new year. Seeking evening clothes, of course, the poet discovers instead morning clothes. Evening clothes, morning clothes. You know, the, the clothes, I mean, it's, this is all, you know, I'm not, I know it sounds cutesy, but this is Jimmy Merrill, and there's nothing about Jimmy Merrill that's, I mean, James Merrill was many, many things, um, and one of the things I want to notice about his writing, in fact, and even the kind of clubbiness of our, the deliberate kind of fancy clubbiness of our, right? That kind of fancy upper class white gay uh, 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 sort of cultishness or clubbiness, or, you know, uh, we're so inside of our, our Italian tailor. You, you said I'm saying that kind of the feel, I, and, I'm, and I'm, I don't want to put this too, too I don't want to overdo this, but that sense of like, our crowd, our Italian tailor, our, just the idea, I don't know about you, but I don't have an our Italian tailor. I, I'm not that kind of gay, but more importantly, I'm not that kind of refined inside the beltway, so to speak, or, or inside the realm. I mean, do you have an Italian tailor that you would think of as our Italian tailor? I don't. If you do, uh, more power to you, but I'm not that person. I don't have an our Italian tailor. He does. So one of the first questions we want to ask ourselves is, who is this our? our Italian tailor. Well, clearly it is, as you see, the poem is dedicated, yes, to David Calsto, yes? David Calsto, does anyone know who David, well, stupid question, sorry, dumb question. English professor, uh, a modernist at Rutgers uh, with whom uh, Merrill was very, uh, Merrill was very close to, to, uh, uh, to uh, Calsto, Calsto died uh, about 10 years before he did of AIDS. Um, 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 our Italian tailor, so that sort of clubbiness of our Italian tailor, right? Um, uh, the other thing I just wanna remark here, <sighs> investiture Cachonis, by the way, you went, so investiture, Denny, you would know all, all about investiture, yes? Investiture, actually, Denny, just tell us what investiture is. Could you just define investiture? Sure. Um, so investiture is the act or formal ceremony of uh, conferring authority or uh, the symbols of a high office on yes, somebody. Exactly. Yes, but specific and moreover, particularly, it's quite religious, right? Very, very, very yeah. religious. Yeah, there's uh, there's a sense of adornment um, and uh, yeah, religiosity to it. 
So I don't want to overdo the gay thing here, but I don't want to underdo it either. So what I want to notice here is that what Merrill is, as it were, calling forth, what he's summoning, what he is summoning here, rather like at a seance, uh, and I'll come back to seance in just a second, a little bit, is a world of what he's calling forth is a world of, um, of, uh, of where of not just gay, but highly kind of gay, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, uh, a, a, a sort of sartorial tradition, um, uh, even a religious affect, right? Uh, even, a, a, put it this way, when I say religious affect, what's going on here? Uh, investiture at uh, Some of you, uh, uh, the, the stories about, say, uh, uh, Francis Spellman at, uh, at uh, St. Patrick's, there were all these times, there's a kind of, there's an old kind of connection between gays and kind of clothes horses. And particularly um, th those, uh, those, those religious, those sort of gay types who are given over to what uh, is referred to as smells and bells, smells and bells, high Anglican or Catholic ceremony. So here's this guy. So just to start with the thing. He had his dream. And what's his dream? He dreams that he goes to our Italian tailor. Italian. It's not the it's not the Vatican, but it's kind of, you know, it's the same country, right? Same district, same post up, same uh, same zip code, right? Our Italian tailor. Caro, that dream, dear one, Mr. Calstone, David, darling, dear one, that dream after the diagnosis found me losing patience outside the door of our Venetian tailor, of Venetian, sorry, our Venetian tailor. I wanted evening clothes for, I wanted clothes for the, I wanted evening clothes for the new year. Question one, uh, uh, whose diagnosis? Real question, whose diagnosis? Whose diagnosis? It doesn't, I mean, the answer is we don't, we're not told, right? After the diagnosis, after the diagnosis. Uh, uh, okay, we'll come, I wanna just remark here, uh-huh, very quickly, after the diagnosis, there's, yeah, okay, just never mind that for a second. Okay, and just the, the first thing I want to notice about this, uh, the second thing, the last thing I want to notice about this, about this stanza before we move on is patience, you get the pun, right? D can you see the pun there? Yeah, the pun in patience. So found me losing patience. I'm losing patience, we're losing patience, right? Just at the hospitals, right? We're losing patience. Found me losing patience outside our Italian tailor. So just that juxtaposition here of privilege, ornament, and death right? Privilege, ornament, and death. And one of the things that I want to remark here is this poem, what renders this poem both, what, what makes it sort of glitter, and also what renders it as it were problematic, I want to suggest, is the fanciness. This is a fancy world that he's describing, but it's also a doomed world, right? It's a doomed, it's a doomed hour. It's a doomed hour, but as you'll see by the end. Um, one other thing, as you'll remember by the end, one other thing I just want to remark here Merrill, and it's really, it's really an amazing thing to think about. One of Merrill's, and he's not the only one, he'll, not the only poet who's, who does this for us, right? Merrill, uh, uh, Merrill takes, uh, his most famous, the most famous fact about Merrill is that he and his boyfriend sat up in a, in a, uh, for, for a decade in an attic with an Ouija board, that, and they were not kidding. The, the Ouija board was the, is both the instrument and uh, was truly, Merrill's, James Merrill's muse for his long, long poem, The Changing Light of Sandover. He took that seriously. He, so every, every uh, I don't know if you've ever done an Ouija board, I haven't, but I, mean, I have, but it, it scares me. But every single, uh, every relation to that sense that one actually gathers a relation to the spirit world. You have a relation to the spirit world through the most, through both really tacky things like an Ouija board, really exotic things like, and, and all our Italian tailor, that we have this relation to the spirit world and the, 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 the comfort that Merrill has. I mean, the way that one has, when you first wake up from a dream, that dream wasn't that dream, that sense of like calling the spirit world and the comfort doing so, okay? And the sense that that spirit world, he's connected to the spirit world, both by means of having a fancy Italian tailor, but also by making something else as well. And that's that I want to turn to now, okay. Then a bulb, then a bulb went on, then a bulb went on. The old woman, she who stitches dawn to dusk, she who stitches dawn to dusk in the, his back room opened one suspicious inch all the way, all the while exclaiming over the late hour, fabrics, patterns, fabrics, patterns, fabric, those the proprietor must show by day, not now, till the lightning in sight. Cracks her face wide, mach the signore, the signore's here to try on his new robe. 
Now here's what the next stanza is what I want to notice things getting super interesting. Uh, 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 robe, she nods me onward. That phrase, she nods me onward. As if what? As if the nodding itself nods me onward is what brings him onward. Do you see what I'm proposing? She nods me onward as if the agency of his onward uh, of his onwardness. She nods me onward is the agency uh, is is his is the nodding is is been now conferred has excuse me has been transported from him to her. Now I want you to think about the experience of a dream because this is so much about this. I want to suggest what is the experience of a dream? The passivity of like and then and then and then. The, the, uh, the, 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 well, I think what Meryl is touching on here is the way that the experience of a dream, which is there's action, but you're not the agent. Things are happening to you, right? You are being constructed by this. Oh yeah, you're seeing it, you're believing it, you're having done or been having it done to you. All these things are the same, right? The passivity, to put it very simply, we take dreams lying down. These are things we take as it were lying down, right? So there he is, right? He's very, it found me. He didn't, uh, in this dream, I went to my Italian, our Italian tailor. Our, that dream, after the diagnosis, found me losing patience. Found me losing patience. So there he is. He's found, uh, the dream finds him. He doesn't make the dream. Yes, analogously or similarly. He, he is nodded on forward by the, by the, uh, by the woman, by the proprietor, excuse me, by the spirit, the spirit of this, of this, uh, of this, of this, uh, of the Italian tailor robe. Okay, uh-huh, not robe. She nods me onward, the mirror triptych. And this is, you know, uh, the, three, the three fates, yes. The mirror triptych, the mirror triptych summons three bent crones. It's, it's the Weird Sisters, yes, it's, it's, uh, it's Fate, it's the Weird Sisters, it's Macbeth, uh, uh, she, she diffracted into back from no known space. So there's three of them now, there's three of them now. There's, suddenly he's been nodded onward into a scene from Macbeth. He's suddenly with the Weird Sisters. There are three of them now. They converge by magic, arms, full of moonlight. And what does the moonlight does resolve into in the next stanza? Up my own arms glistening. Sleeves are drawn, cool silk and grave, white folds, oriental morning. The, 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 cost, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the costume uh, uh, of, uh, of uh, sometimes a kabuki, yes, uh, uh, Japanese. Meryl was obsessed with things Japanese, he adored them. Um, uh, they convert arms full of moonlight up my own uh, gliss, cool oriental morning sheathes me throat to ankles. I turn to face her, uncomprehending. Thank your friend, thank your friend, she cackles. The professore. Wonderstruck, I sway like a tree of tears. You, miles away, sick, fearful have yet arranged this heart-stopping presence. Now, I have, tradi I have uh, written on this piece, it's one of the first pieces I wrote about, I've written about, it was the first articles I wrote, connected to actually a topos that I discovered, uh, well, just, well, that I consider in uh, Victorian poetry, uh, in memoriam, uh, uh, inter, uh, paris inter, I mean, uh, among, the first among equals, but that sense of, there's a sense in which homosexual, just to foreground this, uh, homosexual uh, 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 identity or homosexuality is is cannot be disambiguated. Is entirely uh, uh, as it were woven together with death, with death. Our Italian tailor turns out our Italian tailor is the instrument and image of of death. Oriental mourning. Our Italian tailor. What does our Italian tailor at the end of the day? What does what does our Italian tailor stitch together? Oriental mourning, a, a, a costume which is at once a costume for the dead and a costume of the dead. It's the ghost, it's a ghost, it's a ghost. Oriental mourning, you, you see what I'm saying? Sheathed in oriental mourning. So you become a ghost, you dress, you are, as it were, dressed, uh, 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 the sense that the fabric itself uh, uh, of our Italian tailor, if I am correct in thinking that our Italian tailor is a coterie, uh -huh, 
uh, that our signifies a coterie, which is, if not exclusively homosexual, is undeniably so. But yet, which yet? Um, yes, yes, yes. In Como, right? Am I pronouncing that correctly? Yeah, that is exactly correct. I'm curious about the yet, the second last line. Has not been ordered, it has been ordered. Excellent question. Uh, 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 I would say my understanding is that, that it's, uh, that it's, uh, uh, that the yet here is, even though you're sick and fearful and miles away, you've yet arranged this heart stopping present. Even though you're sick and fearful. D does that make sense? And, and I want to remark something here. I don't know how old, well, you're all too young for this, but, but uh, that sense that, um, that, uh, that, that have yet arranged, I take it to be, even though you're, even, you, to put it crudely, you, even though you're sick and fearful and miles away, you had the, the agency, the foresight, the power to arrange this from that vast distance. D does that make sense? Yeah, one of the, one of the literary point I wanna put in here before I forget, and that is, wonder struck I sway like a tree of tears. One of the things that I think is amazing about this image, and, um, yeah, I think so, absolutely. Can you tell my name again? I mean, uh, 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 your real name, I'm sorry, Chill. I can't see, I'm sorry, what does it say? It's Kara. Kara, thanks, Kara. Thanks, Kara, okay. Uh, yes, uh, 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 he, uh, final here. Yes, he struck it. He originally had the word, um, uh, the words, uh, yes, exactly. Uh, um, when you say final, the word final, was instead of a yet, is that, is that, is that right? Uh, one final present. Of oh, one final present, you have yet arranged, oh, right. And heart stopping is so different. Also, what do you, oh, I see, it just simply said this, what, have yet arranged one final present. Just so much more funereal, <laughs> yeah. Also, think about the difference between um, one final present and this. Mm. One final present is already, in some ways, distantiated, distanced from us. Mm. This heart-stopping yeah. present, it's right here, and it's right here and now. It's beautiful. I think so. Um, uh, uh, the Sway of Tears uh, is an image right out of Dante. Um, it's when Dante uh, is in purgatory, and he perceives someone suffering, but whose suffering will eventually end. And it's, it's the Sway, a tree of tears. The tree of tears, um, just that notion of tears as um, as a, uh, is that, and uh, you know, the, the, like you can access this. If you ever teach a poem like this poem to like young people, and I have not high school, but pretty young, um, uh, uh, it's that sense of like you could. There's always this great moment with Merrill. He really rewards reading because there'll be these moments where all of this fancy, where you say, "Well, yeah, that makes sense as an image." You, we've all been on the verge of tears that way. So you suddenly feel like you yourself are a tree of tears. I think that's right. I want to look at these so remarks. Yes, um, he was thinking the exact things. Snaps us back to the dream. Aha, uh aha, -huh, uh aha, -huh, uh aha. -huh. Yet arranged his heart stopping present. That's interesting, Jenny. So you're proposing that um, at the aha, uh -huh, that at this moment, oh, interesting. Jenny, are you proposing uh -huh, that at that moment, the present is both the present, but also uh, you're waking up? Yes. Lovely. Well, that's actually really smart. That's really smart. I totally see what you're saying. So that. So that, uh-huh, uh-huh, so that what the poet has done is, what the poet does is describe both the way in which uh, his friend's gift, uh-huh, his friend's gift um, 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 gets him all the way into this dream um, and all the way out, right? So that, I, I like your reading of, of present here um, because, um, because I think what it suggests, I really do like it, uh, is something against what I'm going to propose, what I'm proposing. I, I don't know if I've made this argument clear, but my central argument about this poem, and it's insufficient, and it's been insufficient for a long time. I was criticized heavily, and, I, and for good reason, for this, for this reading, this is 30 years ago, um, um, because it's, my reading is a little bit too depressing. It is merely depressing. Gay equals doom, right? Gay, our Italian tailor, is the tailor that absorbs our identity as homosexuals. And I want you to think about the AIDS crisis moment for a second. I mean, uh, whether or not you were around, you certainly know enough about it. I know you do, I know you do. Um, the sense that, uh, that the people who, who were subject to 
uh, in this country, uh, in, this, in the United States, the first announcements of AIDS deaths had to do with more or less comparatively privileged gay white men, right? That's the announcements. Um, but of course, and, and, it, and, it, and it affected many, many people. Uh -huh. um, uh, but that sense that, that, and we all know this sense, we know this sense in the current virus, the way people talk about the current virus, which is, uh, they were kind of, uh, they were old, un, you know, up. What does for so many people, the phrase underlying conditions mean, if not, they were gonna go anyway. They were gonna go anyway. They were old, they were this, they were that, they smoked. Just the way that people talk about underlying, and I'm not suggesting this is always true, and I don't wanna get in the way of the science because this is all true, but how quickly things become allegories. So, right? So if you're a certain kind of minority, if you're a certain, these are all pre-existing conditions. Well, I'm proposing that at this moment, historically, when this poem emerges in the 90s, that the primary pre-existing condition that he is inhabiting here, that he is, as it were, the, the sensibility which imagines, uh, is a sense that he, that he has here, is a sensibility which imagines homosexuality as one of the pre-existing pre conditions which brings on death from AIDS. Right. That's, it was just a moment historically. Are you with me? Do you understand what I'm saying? I know I'm almost out of time. Uh, uh, I'm almost, wait, wait, wait. Uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yes, I want to keep going with these. I'm sorry, I'm just addicted to these comments. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, let me just see what you're saying here. Yet and still, totally. Um, I was wondering if some of this was his own fear. Of, yes, absolutely. Who, who said that? Wait, wait, wait. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Big time, big time, big time. That's what it's about. That's what it's about. And just, this is kind of, there's something as it were kind of basic here that I know you all know, but I want to point it out. And that is how often, how much, if you, particularly if uh, just one really obvious point, if you were, you know, uh, if you were a gay person in 1985 and, uh, and you were reading about people and your friends were getting sick, you had to be fearful for yourself. Right, you didn't have. I mean, even yeah, you had. So point one behind that, uh, 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 behind that, um, 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 uh, you know, there, there's a sense. You know, uh, Rousseau, Rousseau describes two versions of uh, two versions of uh, of sympathy. The the one is not helpful morally, and the other is the not helpful morally uh, form of empathy or sympathy is an animal sees another animal wounded or dying. What does that animal do? That animal runs as fast as it can. Right, because it identifies overly with that the sick animal. It sees that sick animal and it worries. So this is Rousseau. The other kind of empathy is, of course, the kind we prefer. We see someone not well, but we don't identify with him, her, them so, so much that we all we feel is fear that what happens to them is what's going to happen to us. Right. That's I think the other kind of, and I think the various forms of sympathy are at work here, but very much so, very much so. That is exactly right. He is fearful of that. I think that's exactly right. Um, uh, oh, and then the, the, the business about um, uh, 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 the idea of the setting being Venice. Uh, Lois, where's my friend Lois? Where's Lois? Yeah, exactly. Very much so. death in Venice, baby. Death in Venice, right? There's no way that this is not about all those things. And think about death in Venice is another perfect example of the kind of figure that interests me. The homosexual doomed to death, right? By definition, it's the trajectory to, to death. Uh, this is okay, but okay. Well, I just look at the rest of these because I have a yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, when you brought, brought up the evening, morning, morning, oh, yeah, thank well, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. The gender pronouns in stanza two are interesting to me, especially in terms of chat, sorry, who is in the room. Yeah, yeah, how many people are in this vision? It, it, ooh, yeah, actually, that's a really good point, that's a super good point. You're right. You're how many people are? Yeah, how many people are in the room at any time in any stanza? That dream found me losing patience because if also if my pun is right about patience, or if one if one hears that pun, it's all that's also another that's another uh, 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 indefinite. Therefore, there will be another indefinite number of people at that scene. If if they're losing patience, uh, if you're losing patience, then that means that you are. Um, you still got patients around, right? You see what I'm saying? Like, how many people are there? Is it just the two of them? Is it the five of them? Is it, you see what I'm saying? It's like, there's a lot of people as it were in this room and beyond. Um, okay. Okay. Uh, uh, she stitches, counting the people within and without the count seems to amplify, nicely put. I love this. Okay, there's a blame and underlying conditions relative to an upper class in the late eighties. 
in underlying conditions now or a, a, of AIDS relatives. So, so Patricia, could you say that one more time? Say it again. Yeah. I, I was trying to unmute. I just uh, was saying that there's a certain, it relates now because uh, there's a certain blame that goes along with people having diabetes or heart conditions or like they've become obese since they have type two diabetes and there's a certain blame there. And I think that blame existed in the uh, the mid to late eighties relative to gay people and AIDS and you know a certain amount of uh, lack of empathy due to their deserving that or uh, lack of taking something seriously because um, you know, there was a certain acceptance that those people could die just like older people or people with underlying conditions now. That is precisely my point. That is exactly right. Thank you. That is exactly right. Um, uh, that is exactly right. I've been wondering, America asks, it says, about the relationship between the crown and the narrator, her alignment with light and lightning and his being wonderstruck in a tree. But does the moisture of his tears protect him? I don't know protect him somehow. I actually said, can we just turn to that, to that last section? I think it's such a great question. Um, so let's, I wanna actually, res thank you for this. It, it is so great. So let's just look at that last standard together. Um, thank your friend, she cackles, the professore. Wonderstruck I sway like a tree of tears. You miles away, sick, fearful, have yet arranged this heart stopping present. I'm gonna just, there's so many different kinds of tones here, I think. Um, there, or I should say tones gather here. One is the kind of cackling of, the, of, the, of, of her, of, of the, uh, the crone figure, yes, that kind of fairy tale figure. The other is, I wanna just make a point here. Wonderstruck, I sway, sick, fearful, you miles away. There's, there's an element of, it seems to me, tell me if you think I'm wrong, of gratitude and admiration here. Wonders, you're dying somewhere at, in New Brunswick right now, more or less alone, right? I'm not there, right? I'm not there. Uh, um, I'm not there with you. Uh, uh, the, only, the, only relation, the only person I know with relation to you is me. There's no one else at your hospital room, right? I was thinking about these lines Wonderstruck, I sway like a tree. You, so even though you're so far away, even though you're sick, even though you probably don't even know you did this, have yet arranged this heart stopping present. And I'm gonna say something about this, which I suspect you all know one way or another. Sometimes people have, we have dreams, uh, you know, about or from or through the dead. We know it, we just, and that sense that, uh, of the difference between that being a hallucination on our part, because of course they're not really there, right? And our sense that they are, are there, you get to a moment where the difference between those things ceases to be a difference which makes a difference, as William James says. It's sort of like, okay, one way or another, he was there, right? In my dream, one way or another, have yet arranged this heart-stopping present. I think that's really important. As you know, I mean, just think of this, a really obvious point, there is no religious tradition. There is no religion. There is no religion which does not take dream work seriously as a point or a portal of prophecy. There is no religion which does not take the dream of prophets seriously and which does not recognize at some level that dreams constitute a portal to something else, to another place. I take this one of the things that's really marvelous about Merrill is how seriously he takes these, this dream. I, I think so. I wanted to say one other thing. I kind of wanted to, I don't know what our timing situation is, but I wanted to say one other thing about, yeah, when I walked through these, because I don't want to make this, uh, the crones, okay. As ever, he twins with the professori at the end, big time. He twins with him. He's one with him. Uh, uh, he, you know, it's not a body bag. It's, uh, it's not, it's not, uh, it's not, excuse me, he's not a ghost yet but he definitely does. And that sense, really simple point. I mean, I just think this is something that you can bring home in the simplest kind of moral terms as well as in sympathy, you know, just as, as sympathy. And that is that moment where you're terrified. Think how often with your own kids or the kids with each other, you're, when you're most angry or, or, or hostile or annoyed or whatever toward, toward that person with whom you identify, oh, maybe over, I'm scared, I see people, so whatever. There, what could be finer than the finer than the moral elegance involved in saying, you know what, though, I still, 
I still admire you and I accept the identification. I even accept the hurt, right? That sense of like, okay, that just the movement from, I, I would propose from sympathy one to something like sympathy two. Um, yeah, it does mean it's not, that's interesting. That's very good, Lois, that's true. Okay, uh, the Crohn's are interesting to me uh, because the seams just turns into three and he goes from, from two, where is he? T oh, where? Oh, because of the uh, the wait, the uh, um, uh, in coma. The the uh, where does he go into two? Um, well, he he he's starting out as two. He and his friend mm -hmm. we're talking about. Got it. I you I you, and then by the end, because he's wearing the thing. Is that what you mean? Yeah, 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 yeah. Nice. That's nice. Really nice. Really nice. Uh, 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 it is well, very much so. Very much so, uh, very much so, America. And uh, 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 this was not, Merrill was not someone, well, you know, of course, he, knew, he knows everything. Uh, but, um, but yeah, absolutely agree, America. Now, the one other thing I wanted to say about this poem, the reason, I, when I, I thought about it, and it didn't occur to me till later to think about this, but what's the, we all know the fundamental kind of fact about, um, the, the, not the most horrible, but certainly amongst the horrible facts about the current, uh, about the virus now is the isolation, right? I mean, how many times can we be told and how, how I mean, how much it affects us a lot, all of us, the thought of dying alone, right? Not even being able to see the face of the nurse in front of you. Not even being able to say the face of the nurse or the doctor in front of you dying alone, right? That sense... I think by the end that this by the end of the poem, that sense that oh my gosh, across this distance, a distance of you know three inches of plexiglass or three three thousand or ten thousand miles across this distance, it's a really basic point. But what a what a better I cannot imagine a better way for a poem to declare in the midst of terror, through the confusions of dreams, through, through sickness of every kind, this sense of some the possibility that no matter where you are, you can hear from the dying and the dead. You can hear from the dying of the dead. Do you, do you see my point? It makes me think of that great line of Stephen Greenblatt. He begins uh, one of his books with the phrase, this book began with the desire to speak to the dead. Uh, in, that, in that sense, right? That sense by the end of this poem, have, have yet arranged this heart stopping present. Have yet arranged this heart stopping present. Okay, I'm dead with my little shtick. Are there uh, feelings? Yeah, 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 yeah. Same time, there's an incredible close, in spite of distance. That is so true. That's so true. And that is really beautiful. That's right. Have yet arranged. And just the sense that he can speak so, you know, readily and in the same tone in some sense, right? His attitude toward his friend has not changed as the poem has progressed. Um, um, so even though I regard this poem's relation to um, to, uh, I, 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 you know, I've always, I've been, I've, I've, I've argued for the specificity of the relation between the speaker here, uh, uh, between this, uh, excuse me, this, the specific nature, excuse me, character of the speakers here as uh, the historically specific character of these, uh, uh, of these characters here as gay men of a certain moment. You know, uh, if you'll forgive me for putting it this way, there is, if not a universal element, a constantly re redeployable or redefinable element of this poem. That's how good this poem is. That's what I think. That's what I think. So the difference is a partially, yes, isn't that the truth? God, I could just sit here and read your responses. <laughs> There's a conferring of nobility. Who said this? Kara, boom, baby, boom. That's exactly right. That sense that, I mean, I mean, if you were to take even the, the three sisters, even if you were to take the weird sisters in this, it is definitely a, a conferring of nobility. Yes, it is distinctly a conferring of ability and at what cost, right? And at what cost? Uh, 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 sometimes when I think about this poem, I, uh, uh, I think about, um, yeah, anyway, yes, I think that's exactly right. It is a conferring of, an, of a nobility, Patricia. Family members are sometimes the only ones who mourn in white in some Asian cultures. Yes, yes. I, I took, well, yes, yes. You people are so smart. Can I save these, com this com these side comments? Or do I have yes, to? You, 
Yes, you may. And and I actually, I'd love it if we could turn to having people either read these comments aloud so you can respond to them or oh, sorry, raising their hands. Right, yeah, yeah. No, sure. that's wonderful. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. I know that family members, I'm reading a Patricia's comment, that are sometimes the only ones who mourn in white in some Asian cultures. Yeah, that is such a good call. Uh, I took this as conferring a familial relationship as the investiture from a friend who was dying. God, yes. That's exactly right. And this is such a weird thing to say, but yeah, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. Um, in some African cultures as well. It's haunting too, the investiture motif, borrowed robes, borrowed robes, boom, baby, boom, all of that. And that's, yeah, in the sense that some, yeah, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Also just the idea, yeah, exactly, okay. Um, uh, uh, in, uh, there's also this idea of confusion and disorientation. I think so much about these moments of plague are about confusion. God, yes. So true, so true, uh, uh, so true. I'll say one other thing here while people are talking. Um, that um, for those who, I, I just, this is actually helping me a lot understand uh, something about the burdens of the moment. You know, the thing about that whole, uh, the AIDS activism moment, um, uh, and this poem is not part of activism, but it's certainly part of AIDS. That was a moment in the 80s where, and there's a great deal of talk now, but I'm sure a lot of you know this, I don't mean to, but the, the kind of uh, re re recurring to and considering the history of things like ACT UP, the, a the AIDS coalition, you know, the, um, and, and the, the, the specific politics are really important. Every single issue was really important, but partly I want to propose that those meetings were about just being around other people who had the same shit as you, right? It's just kind of like hanging out, right? Hanging out before the door where you're, you, where you're finding yourself losing patience in both spellings, right? You're mad. Act up, fight back, fight each. But it was also partly just a matter of like as close as you can get to being family, right? It's like you're with other people, right? You're with other people. Those affinity groups, it was with other people where the affinity group was so important because you had nowhere else to go to talk about these things, right? That sense. And I think in a way, this thing about plague and confusion is also about isolation, of course. Together but alone, alone, if you see what I'm saying. Yeah. Um, I, I, I I think so. I think that's right. In that sense that 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 our Italian tailor, this heart stopping president, that sense that we can communicate with people even if we cannot see them. This social distance stuff, obviously, was different. Uh, but just that sense that that we can um, we can be with one another and talk to one another even with this. I think that's right. I think that's exact. <sighs> Sarah. Yeah. Oh, yes. And I was going to say, Sarah has a question. If Sarah, you'd like to pose your question. Yeah, actually, yeah, I, Sarah, I, hi. I had a comment. I don't know if it's open time for that or. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, sure. Not enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I really just want to say I, I really appreciate this class. And the poem at first for me was a little difficult to penetrate. I did do a lot of reading on the side. And I just wanted to share that um, I learned that Merrill and Calstone had a real deep connection to Venice. Um, there was actually a tailor, Ciccioni, who created for Merrill a new version of the black suit he bought in Venice in 51. And um, Calstone had a matching one. Yes. Um, it was, they called it like their team uniform and it had a scarlet lining. And once Merrill said, looked at um, Calstone's suit and said, priest outside, cardinal inside. Yeah. So I found that then I know I knew more of the poem once I knew the history and there's an intimacy just in that matching suit. And like someone said before, it's like there's this merging of their bodies. So that was just beautiful. That's exactly right. And a great deal, a great deal, Sarah of Sarah. Yes. Yeah. Sarah. A great deal, Sarah, of um, of uh, Merrill's relation to Calstone. He was, Cal David Kelso was, you know, very obviously a lot, he was all that, but he was rather like some, some rather like me, a lot of other, he was, he was not one of those, he was like good with clothes. He was just sort of a nerdy professor. And so one of Jimmy Merrill's, one of his favorite things to do was to kind of bring him, you know, basically help him dress, 
So that was the nature of the relationship. He was constantly helping him dress and making fun of the fact that he couldn't keep things clean or stuff like that. He, whatever. He was he wasn't the he was kind of like a hayseed gay. So he was constantly getting him dressed right. That, that's what, so it's very funny for this to turn around at this moment, and now it's and now it's Jimmy Merrill who's being dressed by his friend. He's great. You see what I'm saying? Thank you. Yes. No, thank you. America, would you like to pose a question? Yeah. Well, one thing I'm always curious about when I read poetry is uh, why and when authors want to choose the, end, the dash over other forms of punctuation. And I just yeah. know if you could you speak to a little bit about why kind of the, you think the dashes are where they are I, and um, or, you know, um, or why it doesn't matter. Oh, I think it matters a lot. And I think it's a really good question. Dashes are, as you know, God, lives, you know, so much has been figured about with the dash, so much. I, I don't have like a good answer to your question, I, but I have a kind of fast one, which I think is probably partially true. I think for Merrill, um, uh, the dash, which which he, he doesn't use, um, uh, uh, my sense of Merrill's use of the dash normally is that it's a way of indicating an emotional jump or leap. I'm not sure that I see this here in the same way. Why after white folds, oriental more? Well, I guess so. That's my sense though, um, America of, of, of with, yeah. I don't know. I just, I just saw like the, when things are kind of paired and put together and kind of like grouped through the dash, right? So you have the Oriental morning and you have the uh, miles away, sick, fearful, like those are the two that are kind of grouped together. And then you have one that's kind of embedded in the middle of the stanza and then you have one that ends the stanza. And I think there's so much about like empty space there about what's unspoken. Oh, yeah. um, and I'm just, you know, um, and I just all the talk about who's in this room, who's in this community, you know, um, uh, how, how many people are there? I think all that confusion and all that kind of like unanswered questions is kind of encapsulated by the dash. I don't know. I totally agree. I, it seems to me that that first dash that you're talking about, I mean, maybe I'm wrong here, but it seems to me that one of the things that's going on here is that the poem, is, is it like the speaker is saying that he can't quite identify when she stopped um, exclaiming right? It, um, th there's that dash. All we know is that by the end of that dash of, of the late hour, um, well, I don't know. So, 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 so with this one, actually, well, let's just, I mean, if you were to like, let's play with the, um, the hypothesis that what? That the dash sutures together what is, what's contained in the middle of the dash with what takes place on either side. So if I'm, if that's so, then even the dash America that ends the second stanza, the late hour would, would that, that there's something in, in included in that, in that, that, that fabrics patterns, what takes place in the, it was the beginning of the next stanza is as it were embraced by the two things on either side of the stanza. So does that make sense? So in other words, America, uh, she's talking, talking, uh, she's doing her thing. And then we have a quotation from her fabrics patterns. Um, yeah, that's, and somehow that, uh, yeah, I, I can't say much more about that there. Um, um, yeah, the I have nothing, <laughs> nothing else to say really. It's just that I think the dash does indicate a way of suturing together things that he either wants you to make sure you understand or sutured together or he worries aren't quite sutured together enough. Maybe something like that. Uh, his use of dashes are, um, they are, uh, I mean, he uses them a lot, but they, I think they, they signify. Yeah, sick, beautiful. You Wonderful. Well, yes, yeah. I, I hate to break in. Um, we'd like to send you back into small groups for a few minutes. And before we do that, um, we at the Academy for Teachers would like to thank those of you who've been listening by live stream. We hope that you have enjoyed this, uh, this discussion. And for those of you all who are here with us in Zoom, we'd like to send you into small groups for 10 minutes to give you a chance.